welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Well, in today's episode, we're looking at five unforgivable mistakes that almost every new GM will make and which most experienced GMs will fall into from time to time and which I can absolutely guarantee you I have done as recently as last Sunday. So these are common, common mistakes that we all make and they're not the usual things that you might find on the internet. These are things that I have looked at over time and built a list around. So there are some interesting things in this list. If I look ahead at what we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about something that has to do with metagaming and gods. We'll be talking about putting characters on a pedestal, putting players on a pedestal, and the dangers that go in with that. There's looking at the difference between adapting and inventing, and why inventing is so bad, as well as several other things that form the bulk of this list. So it's an interesting discussion and I really would encourage you to leave your comments below and to tell me whether you think that there should be more added. I certainly think there should be personally, but these are for me the pinnacle of failures that GMs make repeatedly and then don't understand why their players become so upset when these actually come to fruition. So without further ado, let's get going. Metagaming outcomes. Now, metagaming is a touchy subject to begin with, and as players and as DMs, we'd like to avoid it completely because, well, then we're not playing in situ. We're not in the game. We're out of the game. However, metagaming for a GM can become a major problem when that metagaming starts to translate into how your villains and how your situations and scenarios have been plotted out. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, if you have a party of adventurers and you're sitting there late one evening trying to work out what the next adventure is going to be for these people, the metagaming component that starts to creep in is you start to analyze their powers, their abilities, and you start to design things that will specifically work against those powers and abilities. That's metagaming, and you could argue, oh, but it's to make it more challenging for my players. Well, yes, but at the same time, it's also punishing your players for choosing their specific roles. If they'd been playing something else, the same adventure would have had different traps, different monsters, different encounters altogether. Why is this bad? Well, it's not bad if you handle it correctly. On the other hand, if you plan for every encounter, every adventure to find the weak point within the character's build within the player's uh, play styles, if you're constantly attacking those weak spots, then what you're doing is you're just manipulating the game to make it difficult for your players rather than to make it challenging for their characters. That's the kind of metagaming I'm talking about. Let me try a different example. Let's say you have an encounter planned with a bad guy who is aware that the playing party is quite diff is quite challenging. They're quite well armed and well maintained. You now decide to equip him with a magical item that removes all magic from the area because three out of the four party members are magic users. And if you cancel out their magic, they're going to have to think of a more creative way of defeating the enemy. But you then realize that there's also a fighter involved in the party. So he's got lots of damage dealing attacks. So this villain of yours, who's now got anti-magic, now decides that he's going to have a series of traps that he's laid out about him so that when the party arrives, the warrior who's not very good at dexterity saving throws will fall into one of these traps and will be rendered useless, leaving the three magic users who cannot use their powers to face the wrath of this now all-powerful villain of yours. What's now happened is that the villain has got abilities of godness. They can anticipate exactly what the party is going to be doing and work their plan exactly to manipulate it. That might be okay for your supervillain who's had henchmen spying on the party and trying to work out their weaknesses for several events and the players are aware that the villain knows their weaknesses. On the other hand, if every one of your villains starts to anticipate the abilities of the characters that are outside really of the realm of what they would know if they were actual real beings, that starts to become very tedious and very boring. 
The players know that no matter how they plan, no matter how they anticipate, your villains will always have the ability to metagame solutions. Now this metagaming continues when your villains are trying to escape. Again, you know the powers of your players' characters, and your villain does not. Well, at least your villain shouldn't. If you are allowing your villain to make and take advantage of your player's character's abilities, you're metagaming your villain out of the box, and you might as well just say, well, he escapes, and there's nothing you can do about it. The frustrating part comes in when the players have absolutely no way of anticipating that he would have a counter for every single one of their powers. It becomes very, very difficult, and players, well, lose interest. If your villains, if your monsters, if your encounters can anticipate everything, even though they shouldn't normally have been able to anticipate anything, or only a few things, well, what's the point in playing? You're constantly working against them. So metagaming and giving your minions the ability to anticipate what the party's going to do, even though they shouldn't, is a very bad sign. And it's not a sign of a good GM who creates challenging encounters for the players. It's a sign of a weak GM who's just using the players' limitations against them. Try and avoid it. Try and cut it out altogether. Have your villain plan their traps and then watch with glee as the players manage to work their way through them with relative ease or with some difficulty, but not that you've designed it specifically to thwart the players. That's, that's, that's not good. Too much background information, too much history, too much prologue, too much exposition. This is something that happens when dungeon masters have drawn out their entire world with maps for every single area and can tell me the entire stat block for an NPC in an obscure little tavern on a little dusty road in the middle of a continent that no one is likely to visit. If you've done world building and you've relished it, you've enjoyed it, it is part of our perk of being the game master. We come up with these fantastic worlds. But if you've done all of that and you've worked out 5,000 years worth of history where you've got this battle and that king and this queen and that wizard who's done this or that starship who blew up that planet causing this social economic collapse of this empire, all of that kind of stuff, you've got all of that worked out. Now, when your players are asking a piece of history, you give them a three-hour lecture on it. That's too much information. That's really too much information. No one's going to be interested in it. My world of Braxia that I play in, and if you haven't heard about it, head on over to Bacon RPG, where there's a brief tour of it. That brief tour takes, I think, about 12 minutes to move between the five great continents. Five, one, two, three, four, five, five great continents. <laughs> It's a lot of information to take in. And unless you're giving this to your players way beforehand so they can start reading up on it and preparing themselves for that space, it's too much. There's so much that you want to give them, and yet there's so much that they don't need. So what you've got to do, instead of just every time they ask a random peasant on the road or every time they come across a fisherman's wife's postman delivery boy's assistant and they ask them so what's going on in this area instead of giving them this hour-long lecture on the local history what you want to do is you want to tease your history you want your players to want to know more so in your descriptions you can say oh as you're walking along the road you see a small hill on the left on top of that hill, there are some ancient standing stones. They look cold and bleak in this miserable weather. That's it. And if they say, oh, what are those standing stones? You might say, all right, well, give me a history check. And they roll their history, and they get a phenomenally good result. Do you then give them the hour and a half long lecture as to the druids who dragged their stones there 400 years ago and then defended it against the dragon? And then, and then, no, you don't. You simply say, you recall from that one manuscript that you read that those standing stones were erected by druids who were desperately trying to protect the world from an evil dragon. And the stones were rumoured to have the ability to teleport you around the planet. That's it. No more information. You give them just enough that they go, I want to know more about that. I think that could be useful. 
Then they go to the standing stones. Then they get teleported because they work out the little clues as to how to activate it. Only they get teleported 500 years into the past when the druids are busy building the standing stones and they have to help them do it and defend it against the dragon that they were trying to defeat in the first place. That way your characters get to experience the history. They get to experience that piece of information in a far more entertaining way than just listening to you talk for an hour and a half. It's a much better way of doing it. Tease and taunt and deliver when requested. Don't recurgitate, vomit, or otherwise throw up all of your history all over your poor players, because that's exactly how they're going to react to it. An overload of information that has nothing to do with them whatsoever. This next one I picked up from a GM whom I very much admire, and uh, upon thinking about it, I went, you know what, that actually makes a lot of sense. This one has very little to do with how you run the game. It's more to do with how big your table size is. Now, I've done videos on how to run campaigns for six or more players. I've done videos on how to run a campaign with a single player. And at the present moment in time, I'm running a game for a, what, for a single player, running a game for three players, and running a game for six players. Now, you need to adjust your style accordingly. Now, the way that I, I, or what I mean by this is, A, a small group obviously requires a lot more attention in terms of story and detail about each and every single one of those characters involved in the story. You have the capacity to really explore their backgrounds. A larger party requires less plot hooks, less interesting political intrigue, and more opportunity for the six of them to get together and have a lot of fun. So you have to adjust your story. But... And this is something that really stru stuck with me when I heard this advice. You also need to figure out what your personal playing group size is. That's horrid English. You have to figure out how many players works for you. Now, this is something that we forget, is that we're supposed to be having fun whilst running these games. We GM because we find it enjoyable most of the time. Some of you might have been forced to do it because, well, no one else is willing to. But you need to find the fun somewhere. And I think that part of that comes from working out your ideal group size. Being able to juggle just the right amount of people in a group to make sure that it works properly. Now, for me, my ideal group size is somewhere between three and four people. So if I could have three and a half people at my table, I would be ecstatic. Three or four players. That is, for me, the golden number. It allows me to juggle players' characters against each other. It allows the player characters to work with one another. It gives them the ability to cover all of the bases if they want to do that. And at the same time, it gives them the ability to specialize and for the missions to be more focused around that particular specialization that they've gone on. If you give me two players, that's not bad. But I'll probably start to introduce NPCs, and that requires a little bit of admin. With one player, I'm introducing a lot of NPCs, and that poor player is going to have to take on some responsibilities on their own. It's simply too much for one person to, or for me anyway, to keep track of. But maybe you're the kind of DM who actually works better with smaller groups, or who works better with bigger groups. Maybe you're a lot grander in terms of your scale. Maybe your narratives are not complicated little nuanced things where the balance hangs on a single word. Maybe it's more about grand spectacle where lots of players and by virtue of the fact lots of characters are running around causing vast amounts, vast amounts of mayhem. So finding your ideal table size is, in my opinion, a very good way to get your game to be improved. Playing to the wrong size table simply because well, there's seven people who wants to play, and well, who are you to say no? Well, you are the one who's running this game and who has all of the pressure of running it and making it entertaining for everybody else. So that means you get to determine just how big your player size is. So a common mistake that I see GMs making is just trying to fill up that table so they can say, oh, I've got seven players, I've got six players, I've got five players. Maybe you need to stand back and say, well, actually, I work best with two players or I work best with six players and then try and get to that golden mean so that you can actually enjoy yourself. So knowing your player table size is very important. Now, before we get on to the last point, which is adapt or invent and why invent is bad, the point that I want to now talk about is putting players on a pedestal. 
Now, we've all done this from time to time, or maybe it's just me who puts certain players on pedestals, but I generally find that players at my table who are much more involved in the game, who put in that little bit of extra work, who spend that extra time developing their character, and who send me messages going, I think my character wants to start exploring this aspect, or have got really complicated backstories, and that they want to work with the game, they work with the table. In other words, great players. I tend to focus on them more than on players that I don't particularly like, or players who don't play in the same style that I like, or players who don't invest as much time as I think one should invest in their character. I tend to focus on the ones that I like rather than on the ones that are okay. Now, what happens is, is if you don't rein that in, if you don't control it, the ones that you don't like are not going to get better they're going to feel sidelined and could possibly leave. The ones that are good could start to develop this idea that there's a plot armor that keeps them safe. The DM doesn't want your character to die because the DM's having so much fun playing with that character and manipulating the stories around that character that the character has become integral to the plot. And if the character were to die, the entire plot would to fall to pieces. So by having favorites, by forming a, oh, well, that, that player really does it very, very well all the time, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that player has a fun time. You are disenfranchising everybody else. All of the other players are going, well, his character's important, but mine's really just a secondary sidekick. Some people might like to play sidekicks, but there's a lot of people who'd far rather have a balanced system where you are giving equal attention to all of them rather than just to an individual. So don't put players on pedestals. Rather, focus on the characters and see which characters naturally come to the surface and try and spread the love, if you like, in terms of each character getting their own fair turn, their own fair amount of stories. It's just the way it should work. And it's a mistake that we all make, I myself included. So try and avoid it if you can. Finally, adapt versus invent. And why is invent bad? Well, what's the difference between adapting and inventing? Adapting and inventing here specifically refers to how much preparation time you put into your adventure. Now, we've already handled that you don't want to overload your adventure with so much lore and so much history that people literally get bored to death whilst you are working through your 400 chapters of history of the inn that they are now trying to book a single room in for the night. So we've already handled that. By adapt versus invent, I'm talking about GMs who go, well, if my players are going to be so crazy, so chaotic that I can't anticipate what they're doing, you've just told me I can't metagame my encounters, so they just walk through everything, so there's no point in planning. I'm just going to busk everything. I'm going to make it up as we go along. I've been there, I've done that, and I've said that. And I have done it for years, saying, oh, my plan, oh, no, we can play straight away. We don't. I don't need a plan. I don't need a plan. What do I need a plan for? I'll just run it as it plays. Inventing, making it up as you go along, flying by the seat of your pants, sometimes works. And if you've been a GM for a very long time, you can get by. But you will always be seen for what you are which is someone who's making it up on the fly. Why is that a bad thing? Well, players who are experienced and who are observing the GM fluster their way through the entire situation, they might they might enjoy your ability to adapt uh, to invent as you go along. But there's also a certain amount of well you didn't put any effort into this, so I'm not going to put any effort into this either. There's also in some players the, well, if you're making this up, I'm going to make it even more difficult for you to do that. I'm going to do stuff that I know that you haven't even thought about. I'm going to ask you all kinds of complicated questions and see if I can derail your train of thought. That's one option. The other option, of course, is that you come across as disingenuous and, well, the player's not going to take down notes because, well, you're making them up as you go along, so why should they bother as well? So inventing, going by the seat of your pants, is a mistake. And it shows. And it doesn't matter how much experience you have. And I've done it recently. Players said, oh, you were making that all up, that whole adventure, weren't you? And I went, what, what, what do you mean? Oh, I, I wasn't making up anything. I, it was all planned. It was all planned. No, it wasn't. It was being made up on the fly. In truth, it was simply because I hadn't given it enough time. And that 
is a failing on my behalf. Adapting, however, is a much better approach and it makes use of that mental ability that you are trying to cherish in terms of inventing everything. It still makes absolute use of that whilst giving it a platform from which to work. Now, I've said this before on the channel, but not in this specific context. Plot out your adventure in big, bold points. Plot out your campaign in big, bold points. You don't have to write down everything specifically. We've spoken about going too much into your planning session. When your players then deviate from it, instead of having to invent a whole new adventure, you adapt the one that you had planned. So the NPC names that you've jotted down or the environmental factors that you had planned on throwing at them, the one or two traps that you'd worked out because they're pretty cool to play through. Those can now fit into where the players are going rather than just throwing it out the window and starting from scratch. That's something that's very important to recognize and to take into consideration is that if you can adapt something, it allows you to be creative, it allows you to change things on the fly, but at the same time, it grounds it in a certain amount of planning. So that there's a definite end, there's a definite middle and there's a definite beginning. And it definitely happens in the reverse order so that it makes sense. Anyway, those are my five GM sins that I see being fallen into, committed, five GM pitfalls, five GM mistakes, five things that we do on a regular basis, which can be avoided with a little bit of thought, a little bit of planning, and a little bit of reservation, a little bit of self-constraint. Yes, we want to tell our magnum opus, but we're not writing a book. We're telling a story with a bunch of other people who should be involved in that. And that's something that I have really started to learn in only the last few weeks is the importance of finding a balance between your story and the player's character's stories and the player's stories. And that's something that's quite remarkable. Let me know your thoughts on what are five mistakes that GMs make that are not necessarily related specifically to the game, but more to how we tell our stories and unpack events for our players and how you would solve the mistakes that you are listing, of course, as well, so that we can all learn and adapt from there. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of games.